You're listening to the Talking Headways Podcast Network. This is Talking Headways, a weekly podcast about sustainable transportation and urban design. I'm Jeff Wood. This week we're featuring a one-to-one conversation featuring Billy Terry of the National Transit Institute and India Birdsong Terry, GM and CEO of Cleveland's Transit Agency. They discuss leadership, hiring, and culture change at a large agency. Stay with us. Today's podcast was produced in partnership with Impact, formerly Railvolution. For a deeper dive on livability issues, visit impactmobility.org, M-P-A-C-T mobility.org. Today's podcast is brought to you by our super generous Patreon supporters. Happy New Year and thanks infinitely to all the transit planners, bus drivers, advocates, and friends that support the show. To join this merry gang of zoning misfits and transit lovers, go to patreon.com slash the overhead wire. $2 a month will get you some stickers and a handwritten note. $10 a month will get you one of our transportation scarves. We appreciate everyone's support over the last year and look forward to sharing more episodes in 2024. That's patreon.com slash the overhead wire. Also, if you want to support the show in other ways, check out the show notes in your podcatcher or go to theoverheadwire.com to find links to our Cars or Cholesterol merch, our Talking Headways book club shop at bookshop.org, or sign up for a two-week free trial of our 18-year-old daily newsletter and archive. Thanks for supporting, and this year make sure to listen to this space for opportunities for happy hours, live performances, and updated information on coming attractions. Hope everyone starts 2024 out right, and now let's get back to the show. I'm Billy Terry, Executive Director of the National Transit Institute housed at Rutgers University, and I'm excited to be here today as an impact champion. An impact champion is one of those organizations that supports the ongoing work of impact to build bigger, stronger communities around transit all throughout our country. And today, I am extremely excited to have with me India Birdsong Terry. How are you doing today, India? I'm doing well. How are you, Billy? I'm doing excellent. I'm doing excellent. Now, uh, India and I, uh, we we share a last name, but we're not related. Um, I would be I would be honored to call her family. Uh, and actually, we are family. We are transit family. Um, had an opportunity to know India for, for quite some time. Our paths have crossed. So India, tell us a little bit about India, the leader. Tell us just a little bit about yourself, but with a with a little spiciness of India, the leader. So Billy, that you always lead in with the, the most interesting questions, right? I'm thinking, what is, what is my... A brother from another mother going to ask today. <laughs> so first, I want to say thank you for for being here and, and sharing the the podcast with you. This is really nice to be able to just kind of talk as colleagues, but as friends about the industry and about some of the things that we're facing. I think as a as a nation when it comes to mobility. So India, the leader, it, it, I can say I, I don't know that my leadership ability. I think really depends on the success of the team, and so. It's a little weird to say, but I don't think of it that way. I just feel as one of the team and just the loudest person on the team. <laughs> <laughs> and um, it's funny. I'll tell you a quick story if I can and then get to the answer. We just had our leadership retreat about 30 days ago. And this was, if you think of the the top 50 decision makers at GCRTA, right? We have a little over 2,000 people here. And so a lot of those folks that are in those either C-suite or director level positions or decision making pivotal roles tend to be in the the offices a lot or tend to be the lead person out at the districts or the garages. You know, district is is what we call them. So they're the folks that probably are in a suit, probably aren't getting their hands quite as dirty, you know, physically, but have a lot of the brain power and the connections that move us through the community. And so a lot of these folks are making decisions on their own or at the tail end of a crisis, right? So it was interesting that I wanted to get us out of our, our comfort zone. So true true form, we, we do the educational thing in the first day of the retreat, which is nice because I have, I come from a very long line of um, educators. So in my family, you usually own a business or you're an educator. And so those are the predominant kind of vocations in my family, or you get into politics in, in some weird way, whether it's you're the, the leader of your block club or, Indeed. you know, manage some kind of business or something. So we're, we're not really shy. Um, a little loud, as you probably know, as a Terry. So, <laughs> <laughs> so that's that's what we got into. So we had the educational part actually at the community college, Tri C Corporate Community College here in Cleveland, and then we had the second day where we were supposed to take, and we did. We took our theoretical ideas and put them into practice to be able to really show the leadership that we had really like leaned into 
for the first eight hours, the first day. And then we went down to the foundry. And for those of you who may not be aware, the foundry is a rowing facility, a, a crew facility that's in the flats in downtown Cleveland. And it's an amazing facility, but a lot of people just forget it's there. And so, you know, we did run it through legal and I got everybody to sign off on the waiver and they kind of panicked a little bit because <laughs> I told them, I said, leave your suits at home, you know, wear your sweats and your hoodies and everything. I think I had on an urban league sweat uh, shirt, you know, I sit on the board there and just, you know, lean into who you are. We we got on the, the herbs and the row machines and, and we got in the tank and wow. yeah, it was really cool. We had a lot of folks who, I mean, some folks were red faced and huffing and puffing. <laughs> They had to tap out. <laughs> no, nobody tapped out, but I was a little nervous. But uh, it was nice because we actually had to physically row together mm-hmm. in order to not clash oars and, you know, in order to actually move the boat, so to speak. And I think it really kind of humbled a lot of folks where they learn that you have to follow the leader in front of you. It doesn't matter if you're their boss. Right. And that happens sometimes. Um, you might have an administrative assistant rowing in front of you and their directors behind them. And if they don't follow them, the boat is going to sink. And so it was really fun doing that. And of course, we had a, a competitive spirit where we had a sudden death challenge is what they call it. <laughs> and we had to de-rig and rig the boat where we actually had to put the oars together. And, and that, again, you, you could not row unless you actually help your teammate. Right. So we had people diving on the floor and, you know, doing all kinds <laughs> of things. And so it was really cool. So to your to hopefully answer your question, I think my leadership is characterized by some surprises and also hopefully a good balance of of forward movement. Right. Like you're rowing in the boat, but also being able to kind of have a little bit of uh, humility to it um, and that you have to put yourself in someone else's shoes to really appreciate the product that we're providing, which is mobility Uh services. Right. And if you don't do that completely and immerse yourself into um, listening to someone else's opinion, you'll never really be a good leader. So it, it, I hope that answers the question. But that's absolutely, yeah. absolutely. What, what a what a powerful example of of leadership. But in the reality that at times and in circumstances, everyone has to serve as a leader. Right. What a what a what a powerful example of of, of leadership, servant leadership. So India, now you've been at GCRTA since 2019. Right. right? Coming from WeGo, uh, mm-hmm. Nashville, with our good friend Steve Bland um, yeah. and others, and then in the shy hometown, Chicago. Um, the <laughs> I, I can feel that wind whipping up there now. So I, I don't want to be like super cheesy or generic with this question, but but so I want to ask it like this: Is there an element of India that drew her to? transportation? Is there something about who you are, what you represent, what you believe in that drew you to working in the industry of public transportation? So that's actually an easier question that, than I anticipated, only because my educational background is actually in <laughs> language arts. It's in English and Spanish, right? Which a lot of it doesn't have on, on its surface a lot to do with transportation, but it totally helps. When it comes into branding, right? So WeGo, as you mentioned, used to not be WeGo. It went through a rebranding when I was there. And that's, you know, going into actually your public face with the um, with the outside world, so to speak, outside of your agency and kind of getting that public trust. So that helped there. Public transit is always asking for money, right? <laughs> <laughs> we cannot function without the, the, the federal grants and without the local matches and the state help and all of that. So we have to be able to explain ourselves in a way where it's understandable, it's clear, concise, and transparent, right? Because the the worst thing you want to do in transit is lie to someone because you're going to be found out by 5 p.m., right? Your your rush hour is where you get either, you you, you get made or, or broken. So going from being an English and Spanish major in college and thinking about law and not doing it and moving into urban planning is where I think the transit comes into play. So so I'm an urban planner by trade and community development, community developer type interaction is is where I really kind of got into the work of transit. And so transitioning from community development and urban planning into transportation 
was a little easier than I would have anticipated, but it still was unexpected because I never really would have been able to tell you that transportation was an immediate indicator of urban life <clears throat> and even of rural life as well, right? The accessibility portion, I think you realize that later. But my interest in transit came from working on a community development project in wow. Chicago for the CTA, right? And so I actually started as a facilitator on a, on a bus system redesign. So I was using the community development skill that I had in order to translate what we were doing with and to the community and get their feedback. And then it just went from there and become a service planner and, and, you know, on and on until I am now. So I think the the curiosity to want to know who makes the decision to put our assets in our community where and does it reflect the needs of the community was my immediate introduction to urban planning. And then it was a natural sort of progression in the transit as I learned how to help people find their voice to express what they need. And transit just happened to be where I landed. Oh, wow. I was going to say I got like 50. I'm, I'm, I'm a horrible moderator interviewer because I got 56,000 <laughs> questions. One one quick question. Was that work that you did, were you an employee of CTA at that point or some other entity? When I started the uh, facilitator work? Yes. On the, yes. So, uh-huh. yeah. So I was a full-time employee. They called it, they had some odd name that was like a hybrid, which basically said I think it was full-time temporary is uh-huh. what it was. So I was being paid out of a grant that was associated with the actual gotcha. region. But I was considered a full-time uh, employee, but I was not a permanent employee until I actually had to apply for a job that was not attached to a project. And uh-huh. that, uh, I think my first, you know, real, so to speak, full-fledged position was maybe a year or two later after the redesign was over. And then I became part of the service planning uh, department as a, I think it was a planner one. Right. right. Wow. And look at you now. Look at you now. And so one more question, getting back to when you spoke about your language background and, and how useful that is uh, in your role now as the uh, president and uh, CEO of um, GCRTA, I, I would imagine that those skills are useful because you are communicating with a with a diversity of individuals in the community, right? From community college presidents to local elected officials to people in community, suburban communities. So can you can you talk a little bit about not the so much when in Rome concept, but that the capacity and the and the foresight that has to go into speaking to those different elements of your not just your community but in India the region right speaking to those different elements who all need different things from mobility. So Billy, I think that's a really interesting question. <laughs> I was just writing down little notes while I was listening to the question, right? So I don't forget anything. And first, I'll say it starts with with decent grammar. If if I could just lay right out. exactly, <laughs> <laughs> and you know it sounds silly, but I think it goes a long way. First, because something written well and with intention connotes the idea that you care, right. and it it you know gives the the idea that you're taking your time, you're writing it for the person who's reading it. You know, you're not just writing it at some upper echelon level that doesn't translate to the typical person who's just riding a bus. Mm-hmm. And may not have knowledge or education of all the intricacies of some funding package. Right. You're trying to let them know that you're here to take them from A to B. And then I think it's got to be able to be translatable. So it's funny because we've had, I, I literally was just in here, this office, 30 minutes ago before I logged on to talk to you, talking to our, our internal comms manager. Mm-hmm. And she's a, a lady named Christy Cox doing great job for us, Uh, came from a different system, a smaller system in Ohio a couple years ago, and really has started to kind of shape the way that we are uh, creating our internal communications packet. And a lot of that is trying to understand the difference between the voice that you're trying to have in one document versus another. So the way that you talk to your legislators, as you were saying, might have to have something in that document that speaks to them. So that they can feel confident to be an ambassador for you. But if I'm only speaking to them in the voice that is advantageous for me, 
then they're going to tear it up and go on to the next document, right? right? right. Never get that resolution passed or, or the funding support or whatever I'm asking for. But if I make them feel like they're prepared to answer a decent amount of questions within reason, right? Then they feel like they're armed with more information, understanding that they have to be a supporter to begin with. I'm not here. I'm not a salesperson. I'm not here to, you know, to sell you on transit. You either believe it or you don't. And then we have to prove to you that we're worth your time. So if we have you in that that yes bucket. Right. And, and that's something we started to talk, to talk about internally is, is what's a net promoter score. You've heard that term, perhaps on yeah. the private industry. Right. And that's basically how likely is someone else to sell you on something that I do. They're the word of mouth push. Right. That's the greatest ambassador we can have. You know, respect to all of the legislators that are out there and the support mechanisms and, you know, the APCAs and the Comptos and all of this. They are fantastic, fabulous. We couldn't do it without them. But my main, my main target is that person who's making the decision to take the bus or the train or to hop in their car. And if I can get that person who has a choice, the dependent rider is absolutely important too, right? But if I can get that person who has a choice to hop in a car or an Uber or whoever, a rare a, a ride share, or hop on one of our, our vehicles for public transit and they choose us, then I've won. Because that person is likely going to tell someone that they had a good experience just the same way as they'll tell somebody that they was horrible, don't take it, I never want to take it again, right? I want to be able to have them be our mouthpiece. And the more, if you look at the math on that and you take a, a an alderman or a council person and they've got 10,000 people in their district and 5,000 of them are RTA supporters, that goes a long way. Absolutely. And it reverberates. Yeah. Right. So then when, when that legislator is talking in front of that person or that 5,000 constituency that had a good you know, experience with RTA, it makes it easier. They don't have to sell. They just are reverberating the things they already know. They're regurgitating it. And it's almost like going to church and everybody's amen. Absolutely. All right. <laughs> right. And so then when we need to, you know, ask for $400 million to replace some rail cars, <laughs> it's a little bit easier to be able to get it at the ballot. So that that's the kind of strategic planning that I'm hoping to impart here in Cleveland. Absolutely. And you have a wonderful team. I know uh, several uh, people on your team who are part of those efforts. So it, it only took me 10 minutes or so to ask you to talk about GCRTA. I'm sorry. So, but so can you can you paint a picture for us, India, you know, for those um, who are not familiar with the system there in, in Cleveland, can you give us a sense of um, a GCRTA, who you serve, how expansive you are, the various communities that you serve, and maybe one or two key initiatives that you're engaged in right now? Sure. Well, we've got quite a robust system here. As I mentioned, we've got about 2,100 employees, um, and that's inclusive of uh, two local unions. We have a Fraternal Order of Police, FOP. Um, we do have a transit police force as well that is comprised of about 100 officers. And then when you get administrative and canine and all of that, I'll told you're probably looking at about 150 uh, employees that support our, our security initiative. Um, so they've got their union. And then you've got the uh, ATU, the Amalgamated Transit Union, and they handle the bulk of our um, kind of lay folks, right? The ones that are operating the, the vehicles and maintaining them and, and, and being public um, ambassadors for the program. Um, we have traditional bus, big bus, as we call it here, right? Your 40 and your 60 footers. Um, then you've got your downtown trolleys, which has kind of shrunk a little bit after the pandemic, just because of people's work from home patterns are a little different. But we've got those services for the park and rides. Um, and then we have uh, light rail and heavy rail. We are, are very proud of the fact that we are the only public transit rail operator in the in the state. And so that's a big deal for us. You know, I understand you're from the East Coast, Billy. So you know. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm, I'm right around the way. I'm Pittsburgh. We right down the street. That's, that's, that's yeah. true. That's true. So, you know, we really are excited about that. But it also comes with a lot of state of good repair. Right. So that's what we're in the throes of that right now. I mentioned the four hundred million dollar you know, price tag thereabouts for uh, replacing the rail rail car replacement program. We're in the middle of that now and we're almost there. So we're super excited to bring those cars on in a couple of years. And then we also have direct access to our airport. 
Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. yeah, we were game changer. I, That's a game changer. Yeah, it is. It is only if it's utilized, you yeah. know, the right way. That's the thing we can't take for granted that we're just there, right? Because you could easily just bypass it. So, we have a new airport uh, director that we're really excited about working with as well to just kind of rethink how things work in the city and how we're bringing people into Cleveland. Um, so that's that's going to take a life of its own in a bit. Um, and then we. We also maintain our fleet in-house, right? And we also have paratransit as well. We have paratransit services, um, which is a, a really source of pride, I think, for our community and, and for our board as well. Our, our board chair, Reverend Charles Lucas, is in a wheelchair and a user of paratransit every day. So what better, you know, real, real-time experience, right? Can, can you get than that? We, we handle that. We've got a fleet of about 80 to 100 vehicles that operate, you know, out of the paratransit district with about 100 plus operators and a couple of different three actually uh, third party uh, providers. And we operate the bulk of that. So we handle all of greater Cleveland. So Cuyahoga County is our service area within reason. And we've got accountability to the mayor of Cleveland. We've got a new millennial mayor who's been in for about two years, uh, Justin Bibb. He actually was a former board member of RTA that brought me here to Cleveland. So really excited about that kind of relationship to be able to move the needle forward. And then we've got a new county executive uh, with Chris Ronane, who was a planner. He was a, a city planner by trade. So I'm right in my, I'm in, I'm in my <laughs> You know, we have great mayors and managers through that association. Lisa Barno heads that up. And just being able to think about how to work with constituencies that may not know RTA. So we have three sitting mayors on our board at any given time. And, and that's always an interesting dance to be able to think about how to loop the suburbs in. So we have a lot of things going on, a lot of things. Absolutely. That's an understatement, understatement of the decade. So, India, can I link back a little bit to your community development days and, and, and ask you to tease out a little bit how the, the work of RTA is adding to the regional economic development? Clearly, you talked about the direct line to the airport, but can you talk a little bit about RTA's contribution to, an, I dare say, renaissance, but to the, the, the its economic development? contribution to what's going on at the city, the the residential and commercial development along the health line, just, just a number of different ways that RTA's efforts are contributing to the economic vitality of the city or the region for that matter. Absolutely. Um, so we've got a lot of different avenues that I think we are really starting to kind of get comfortable in again. And I say, I always say kind of like a rebirth, right? So the Renaissance term will definitely take that just being able to kind of like turn the lights back on, you know what I mean? Especially after COVID, being able to, to see people in person and and not being able to do that over the last few years, I'd actually say has, has not been a hindrance for us. You know, it's been a challenge for sure. But I got here about six months before the pandemic started and I was, you know, fresh off the airplane, right? Coming in from Tennessee. And so I think the question was, okay, are you going to be able to, you know, get to know Cleveland? You're not from here. Now I do, a little secret is half my family's from Ohio. And uh, it's Chicago, right? So I, I, Ohio's not new, but it's always new if you haven't lived there. So you never can take that for granted. But I, I had to figure out how to make it my city and to learn it um, in the midst of the pandemic and the virtual age. So our team got together and we really started to think about what do we need to clean up? What areas do we really need to be able to shore up so that when we do emerge from this, we emerge stronger than we were when we got into it? And I said, this is the grind time. Cleveland's a little bit of a gritty city, you know, respectfully. It's a blue collar city. You know, that's kind of what I'm from. And you, you get that with Pittsburgh, same kind of thing. And, you know, we grind hard, but I think we, we grind in silence. And I think that's a benefit. Right. Because you can yeah. get the work done and you can get the shine later. Don't don't worry yeah. about it. Don't chase the award. So that's the culture change that we've gotten into over the last few years. And to get to your question, going back to the community development, I love to be able to see a plan come together, but it has to be done over time. But it has to be done in a hurry. Right. So it's, it's a position <laughs> there. And I think we decided that transit oriented development should be on the top five of our priorities, right? So how can we look at the issues of greater Cleveland and work to start to solve it? And economic disparity is at the top of the list for Cleveland, Ohio, especially in the urban core. So it's a very wealthy city in terms of history and contribution to the country and all of that. 
but you have a different identity going on. And you also have a different strata of economics between your urban core and your suburban areas. And so you could meet somebody that says they're from Cleveland, but they may be from the suburbs and, and vice versa, right? So we started to think about housing, workforce development and job creation, mobility to those jobs and how we can impact that, and also diversity. And those were the areas of interest. Um, we had a, a few others, of course, with the built environment that are equally important to make people and safety. Safety was another one. So when you look at those kind of priorities, it was a great time because we actually were uh, right in the middle of putting the final touches on a, a long term 10 year strategic plan when I when I came in the door. And it takes us out to 2030. Yeah. And it was about halfway done when I walked in and we had done some pillar studies and some great ground you know, research. But we still had to kind of agree that these are the things that were important. And there was a lot in that plan. And being a planner, you know, I can identify a plan that's that's pretty aggressive. And you need to have some steps in between to get to 2030, right? And so we actually signed that off, put the bows on it. And then we went ahead and implemented a short-term plan, a short-term strategic plan in addition to the long-term. So I effectively had the staff go through it again. <laughs> and then, you know, and then we prioritize the things that we could do in three to five years instead of looking at a 10 range. Right. But it's all based in the in the one we had. Right. It's couched in it. Yeah. 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 And that's where the TOD comes from. That's where the micro transit comes from. That's where the workforce and the diversity comes from. Um, and I'll be real quick or quick as I can. Micro transit, for example, is something that we're getting our feet wet. You know, and, and some of our counterparts, Columbus has a great program. Uh, a couple of other close cities have good programs. That's relatively newer for Cleveland because that was a, a question that I got right away from some of the council folks that said, hey, we've got job opportunities out further, right? But the system doesn't take you out that far. There's a gap, the first last mile. How do we get to that? So we, we have a couple of pilot programs out for that. So another area that we had in addition to microtransit was community de development by way of TOD. And so we found that after taking an inventory of the property that we own, the actual land, we had a lot of land in odd places, right? So normally you would work with a developer and they'd ask for a parking lot and maybe or it would or would not be adjacent to one of our, our stations. And so we started taking the premise that if we're going to engage in acquisition or selling of land, it had to be advantageous for the community as well. It had to be able to have some kind of public transit connection. So we've had a lot of development conversations and uh, MOUs in place to be able to work with developers for mixed use income uh, housing, for example. And so that way we have a direct correlation between being able to get to work, being able to support the elderly, low income, black and brown folks, you know, you name it, to be able to live in these high rises, for example, that may be right next to a bus stop or a rail station. So that's part of that sort of forced collaborative process that we now say, hey, we actually have a little bit more power than we thought. Let's go ahead and take advantage of it. And then don't get blinded by the dollar sign that comes along with selling off a weird piece of property for a parking lot, you know? Yeah. And a, a respectful addendum, get to work, get to worship, get to medical appointments, get to school, get to recreation, right? All the other things that, exactly. yeah, that RTA Mobility provides. I'm going to dig in just a, a little deeper and ask if you can expand. You talked about the strategic plan. A, was there any level of community input for the in, in the strategic planning process? And then also, could you maybe elaborate on those opportunities for the ongoing community uh, input. I don't know if you have a broader advisory council or whatever. Okay, so really what I'm trying to get at, um, India, is those elements and those opportunities for community input. As you talked about, your number one lobbyist, right, is an individual who takes your system with any regularity. So elements for community input, um, I guess is the question. Absolutely. So um, if I go back and I rewind a little bit to the, the system redesign we did a couple of years ago, which was next Gen is the name of that. That one we actually delayed. We consciously delayed it about six to eight months because we wanted to figure out how to get the most robust community input in the middle of a new pandemic because it was on track to just come out. Right. Mm -hmm. So all of a sudden you want to have, you know, community input at a library and so and so and nobody shows up because uh -huh. they all get sick. Right. So we had to be able to kind of slow down a little bit and come up with different me mechanisms, whether it was surveys electronically or having, a, you know, digital workshops and that kind of thing 
to be able to, and, and spacing, you know, if they wanted to show up in person to keep everybody health, healthy and safe. So we did that. I will say we also, even after that next gen redesign came out, it still doesn't make everybody happy. You can yeah. do the majority, right? So the, the argument, the, the big fight, right? The boxing match was between more frequent or more coverage. You know, it's, it's like the, the sugar, like less taste, more fun. <laughs> <laughs> and so, you know, we kind of found that everybody wanted everything. So we took a traditional kind of, of way of looking at it to make sure that we didn't have replication of three and four lines going down the same road and you could, you know, have a decent walking distance and all of that. And then we took the next couple of years actually to also clean up our internal processes for community outreach, as you mentioned. So it's funny you should say that. We literally just had the swearing in at the around the holiday time last year in 2023 of our community advisory committee. And that was one that we had for a while, but it kind of dried up during the pandemic. And then it was a great opportunity to say, hey, let's just revamp this whole thing, right? And so if you served on it before, Thank you for your time. You're awesome. You're an emeritus. You know? <laughs> <laughs> so we still yes. want you, right? That is. People, yeah. So we have them as advisors that serve on that, right? A handful of them that still want to be involved and you know are, are, are willing and able. And then we we put out it like a, we put out like an application process, like you would be going for a job, right? right. Because it is a job. Yeah. And they're an extension of our our ten member our board. So they're the CAC is the moniker for that. And they are actually going to have their first meeting coming up in the end of quarter one. So we have a great array of capacities and experiences and a great diversity on that on that team and that committee. So we're super excited to get them started. And they're going to really have that voice of the customer and be involved in everything. So alongside that, we actually just had our first COC, Civilian Oversight Committee meeting last week, actually. And that's our transit police oversight, if you think about it that way. And I'll put the disclaimer out there. We're doing this in a place of positivity, right? We're doing this in a place of positivity. So we're not doing this on the heels of some issue that came up, which is a a really, you know, blessed way to come at it because you can kind of level set and, you know, educate people on how to be a good uh, reviewer of incidents that come up. You know, we don't use chokeholds and that kind of thing. So all of this came out after post George Floyd. This was part of our reaction to say, hey, wait, we've got to make sure that we are, as our deputy for operations calls it, 21st century policing. We want to make sure that we're ahead of the curve on these things because we are riding high with a pretty good relationship with our community. We want to make sure to maintain it. And then at that same time, if you if you go back about a year and a half, two years, we had our police chief who was retiring after more than 20 years in the seat. And so that was a great opportunity. Yeah, great, great guy. But we were going for a little bit of a different flair, right? And that was a good opportunity. Timing was was great to be able to go out there and say, hey, let's let's look at new leadership too. And what does that look like now that we were, you know, coming off of that? So, and that comes with a lot of changes, right? Because my predecessor was here almost 20 years. So you you get the retirements coming. And it just marries up for a good opportunity for me to get in some new faces as well and play, pay homage to the ones that that came here before us. So we have our first. African American female LGBTQ plus uh, police chief, wow. and yeah, we found her right in our backyard, and we had a uh. national, national search. So you got you got to work for her. <laughs> she was already there. Huh? <laughs> she, was, she was there, you know, and she was she had worked with the city of Cleveland for a long time, and this is her first stint as chief. You know, she'd been commander, she'd been lieutenant, sergeant. You know, I said that in the wrong order, but she definitely has paid her dues and and has worked every beat you can think of, and and is a um, an educator as well in security tactics and has a great eye on diversity. So we've actually been able to shore up our gaps in getting enough officers because that's a big issue to work for. So we were down about a fourth of our our, our manpower in the, the police area, and we are at 100 percent at this point. So we've got a waiting list for officers. Wow. Wow. Which, OK. Yeah. We changed our whole hiring strategy. That's a whole different uh-huh. conversation, Billy, that I hope we'll get into but that's another area of uh, of change that we we definitely kind of jumped into feet first. You talked a lot about the assets of RTA to serve the community. Let, let me let me this throw a curveball in here, uh, India. I would submit your greatest asset is your human capital of RTA. I don't know, let's just 
take a moment and, and talk about your philosophy on a enhancing and educating and training your, your workforce and, and let's blend that in and give you an opportunity to talk about you can't you can't enhance them unless you get them in the door first so it give you an opportunity to talk a little bit about your proactive purposeful way that you touch recruitment or did you you know you go about recruitment sure well we we found a lot of opportunities in the human resources and and training air division of our company to really revamp some things, right? Because just the way people are being hired is different now than it was in the 90s or the early 2000s or even 10 years ago. Um, So a lot of the demands of the candidate pool are very different. Folks want to work virtually. They want to work hybrid. They want to have access to childcare. They want to have access to mobility options. I mean, there's, there's a lot of things that people are asking for now and expecting that they may not have said out loud 15, 20 years ago. Right. So a lot of that, and, and, and we are a shift-driven company, right? Like all of our, our, our sister agencies. So we haven't gotten to the point where you can drive the bus autonomously yet. <laughs> not yet. <laughs> not yet. And so, so we, the, our union brother and sisters, we yeah. were uh, that conversation strategically. Yeah. 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 Strategically. Right? <laughs> we, we, we're not at the gym. There, but we'll, you know, we'll get there sometime, I guess. But right now we have to still bring people in. And so that competing with the Amazons that are out there and the, the Uber Eats and the so-and-so and the blah, 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 that you can essentially perhaps make your own schedule or you may not have so many uh, or the same, not so many, but so the same rules and regulations. You may or may not have to have a CDL, right, to be able to operate a, a vehicle, those kind of things. And then you get into the maintenance side of it from the digital era. Do you turn a wrench anymore? Do you have grease on you, right? Or are you hitting a button on a computer and making it move? So all that to be said, we realized that we had to be more competitive and the first rule of of transit is that you got to look at the dash report. Right. You got to be able to see, right? Right. Shout out to Greg Dash. You got to be able to look and see where you are as far as pay. Yeah. That's the check the box item. Right. And it's not an easy check, right? But you got to figure that out. Yeah. I think we're in the top three. I want to say we're the second best in the nation for pay of uh, pay for operator in certain certain areas, according to, of course, your market and all of that. Right, right. So we had to make sure that that was, that was completed. Now, in our agency, we have union and not, we have also administrative, non-union, so non-bargain. We had not done a compensation study for non-bargaining because you got to remember gar- bargaining, of course, goes every two, three years. Absolutely. However, you have to so you have a bite at the apple pretty frequently. And I'm talking about the hiring strategy holistically now. Right. So you could have a very happy union, theoretically, and a miserable administrative workforce who hasn't had that same consideration because they're not contracted. So that's not fair. Right. You've got to make sure that that you look at everybody. So we actually went ahead and, and made the decision to embark upon a compensation study for all non-bargaining employees. We had not done that in over 25 years. Wow. That let me know that you could have someone who was here for their entire career and, and never had a market analysis completed on a formalized basis. So we were had been doing the work, right? So we weren't too far off, but we could move some pieces around, create growth programs for different departments. For example, engineer one, two, three type of thing, instead of just having a position and then the director, right? So people had somewhere to go. And then you, you kind of eradicate that whole well, and what am I worth to you? Right. It says, hey, this is what you do. Let's look through your job description. Let's go through that. It's a little painful. Imagine. Yeah. Yeah. Because you're you're evaluating your work. But then I think it caused us to be able to say, hey, this is what I do for a living. I do a lot more than you realize, RTA, or I don't do as much as you think, I, RTA. <laughs> and then we're able to kind of navigate through that. So we did that, had our board involved. It was it was a good process. Like I say, it was, it was a painful one, but it was a good one. It's a necessary evil. And then quite honestly, mine was separated from that, right? I'm, I'm a contract employee like all CEOs or most are, but I had to take care of the people first, Absolutely. right? And then that way it justifies the job. We also wanted to look at child care. So I mentioned that. This one is a really important piece to me because I, I go through this every day, right? You know, I have two toddlers I <laughs> and I watch those kids while I'm doing this. And, um, you know, at that time, they weren't in school yet. So child care, I, I got it. You know, I'm like, this is tough. Mm-hmm. And if you're a shift worker, it's even harder. Yeah. So we actually are going to be launching in March 
our first, I'm so excited, our first referral kind of, well, it's a program where we will link employees up with resources for childcare, wow. according to yeah. their needs after hours. Yeah. Oh, so, after hours? Yeah. Yeah. Wow. So we're working with a, um, with a company, I won't name quite yet because we got to launch it formally. But we're working through them to be able to kind of say, hey, you know, I'm a bus operator and I start at 8 p.m. at night. Mm -hmm. Well, you can go on this in this program and be able to kind of put in your needs and output a list of providers that can help you during those hours that are already licensed. So it's a great opportunity just to connect people with things. Right. You make the decision. You're the parent. We don't sign you up. We don't watch your kids for you. But we're giving you the resources you need to be successful here. Yeah. Yeah. So. That's one thing. Um, we also had to look at long-term professional development planning and mentorship. So we have the Positive Impact Program. It's, it's called PIP. I hate to say PIP because it reminds me of Performance Improvement Program. <laughs> it is. But it's a, it's a mentor program, Positive Impact. And it's taken off like wildfire. And we have looked toward those agencies that have done it well and emulated them and tweaked it ourselves. And we've had a tremendous reduction rate in absenteeism and a tremendous increase in keeping people here and retaining and retention for our operators and mechanics. And they just have someone to talk to. And so there's all kind of great stories out there. We just did a podcast with AFTA that should be rolling that out, I think in a week or two, um, really explaining the program. And it's been a beautiful relationship between the union and management to be able to keep people here. And then one more thing, I have the little brochure. I know you can't see it on the podcast, but it's our refer and earn program. And basically it gives you up to $500 for referring someone who stays for at least a year. As and an operator? For skilled trades. Okay, so there okay. certain, yeah, so operators one of them, but they have certain trades that are hard to find so that you get paid incrementally, incrementally as your referral employee stays with us. Gotcha. So we want you to stay with us. So you re refer somebody who's not your cousin, right? <laughs> <laughs> Let's say your neighbor or whoever it is. And they they come on board with us and they pass they they pass the the skills test and they get a job offer. You get paid. They pass probation, you get paid. They pass the six month mark or, or year mark, you get paid. So it's a continual kind of investment where now you're becoming a inadvertent ambassador for them to say, hey, man, how you doing? You doing OK? You keeping up with it? Whether mm -hmm. you are interested in their success or not, you want to get paid and you right. want to stay with us. So it's a little, little, little yeah. incentive. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> so having said that, uh, India, I want to get into some some environmental questions. But but first, do you think that these targeted uh, changes under your leadership from taking a look at hiring practices to advance the mentoring program, advancing people when they're in the door. How do you think that's impacted RTA as an employer of choice in the Cleveland area as compared to 20 years ago, what people thought of the RTA as to as to now of being an employer of choice uh, in the region? What, what, what are your thoughts? Well, I hope that it's causing people to look at us as more than just a bus company or a rail company, that they're looking at us as an economic driver, that we actually connect people with social services. You know, we've got an ambassador program now. We've got social workers that work for us, we call them crisis intervention specialists. They actually go out along with a transit police officer when needed and just canvas the system. And if somebody needs help and they're unhoused and they need to find a bed and they're riding our system and won't get off, there's a reason for that. So we have to be sensitive to that. And I'm starting to hear outside of our agency through political leaders, you know, or um, nonprofits. A matter of fact, I was in a meeting the other day and they're like, hey, you know, you, the mission for Cleveland, the city mission actually referred you guys to us you know, or referred you all as an option. We hadn't had that experience before. Wow. They're starting to see and say, hey, RTA probably got a program for that, or let me check. And another thing I think we're starting to see success by way of the people that we're getting in the door. So a lot of the positions we had a really hard time filling before, we're starting to get quality employees that, that want to be part of the change and they want to just be part of the excitement. I'll say a lot of that has to do with our branding. So shout out to Natoya Walker-Miner, 
who yes. is over our, our marketing and external affairs, they're doing a yeoman's job of just making us look good, but telling the truth, you right. know? Absolutely. And I always tell them, I said, don't apologize, you know, for things unless you deserve it. And that's okay. <laughs> you got to make sure that we, so if we make a mistake and we have a delay, we explain to the customers what the problem is and how we're going to fix it. We don't just give them free rides, right? right. Because that doesn't fix the problem. We don't want it to happen tomorrow. So that creates that trust from the community to say, hey, they're going to be a little bit more honest with us. And not to say we weren't before, but I think that's the implied action that you have when someone is trusting in you, their life line. So if yes. it, you know, if we control whether or not you get hired or fired because you can or can't get to that job appointment on time, there's a nervousness that comes with that. We have to understand that part. And then one other thing really quickly is the diversity of our teams, I think, is improving. We have a, a still a, a long way to go in certain areas of the business, but we have employee resource groups. We have four right now that are active. We have one for our veterans that's emerging. We have one for women, female employees that's that's hit the ground running over the last couple of years. We got the LGBT uh, community that is up and running and Latino. Uh, community that's up and running as well. So that's really helped, I think, be able to have those hard conversations and make people a little bit more compassionate. Right. And, and and those are people who probably serve in various roles within the agency, a part of, you're a veteran, but you may be an operator or you may be a supervisor or you may be, right? Right. Yeah. It's, it's, it's everybody. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. You throw your title out the window when you're in right. one of the When you're in a group, it's good. Yeah. Um, so, India, let's let's take a, a few more minutes together. And rightfully so, we are all as a nation trying to move towards more environmentally friendly mindset, right? And that manifests itself a number of different ways, right? So for as a transit agency, can you um maybe give us a a, a brief overview about how RTA is a, is a approaching its role in being a good uh, environmental uh, steward, whether it be facilities, rolling stock, or or let me let me pause and say this. And some of the challenges you talk about being honest, and some of the challenges about being that good environmental steward. Yeah, that's that's a major concern that we have here at RTA. I don't think that we have cracked that nut quite yet. It's on our our plan for this year and next year to really kind of deep dive into it. I will say that uh, my plan is to, part of the plan is to create a sustainability department, and that should be in the works for, for later on this year. So we're actually working on creating job descriptions for that area uh, right now so that we can actually um, lean into that, because I think we've done a lot of good things through campaigns, right? So whether that's being, you know, lead certified on a building right. or having solar panels on a bus stop. And managing our paper usage and you know all of that, and we have CNG uh, comp- compressed natural gas for the bulk of our vehicles. In addition to diesel, we- we've not kind of bust into the electric fleet mm-hmm. yet. And I think a lot of that takes planning, and quite honestly, it also takes the manufacturers to be able to work with us to make sure that we have the parts and you know deliverables on time. So we're working through that, and we're we're on a couple committees through APTA and, and the like. But I think the sustainability part of it is what's to come for us and to really make that part of the the fabric of RTA and not a fleeting campaign. So we're doing great work individually on different projects, but I still think we have a ways to go to make sure that we can actually lead the charge on that. A very targeted approach to it being multifaceted, like you said, spread throughout the agency. Um, That's great to hear. That's great to hear. I'm curious, India, you came so you Chicago, Nashville, Cleveland, many distinctions between those regions, but any any similarities from the different places that you've worked uh, in transit? I think they're all blue collar cities within reason, right? I think there you know is a certain grit to those cities that their leaders in their in their state, you know, either by previous population or or economic drivers. Cleveland, for example, was the top of the heap, and now I think we're trying to get back there as far as population. But the Chicago's and the Nashville and, and any other area that I've, that I've worked in always has a certain grit to it. They have a kind of like togetherness that is it's tough to replicate. And I think they're always underdog cities, uh, if I can say that. And so they're the cities that are always trying to either stay on top 
or compete with the New Yorks and the LAs and the so or the Atlantas and so on and so forth, but they have their own identity. So I, I'll say this in closing for that question. Cleveland has its own identity. The, Cleveland is not trying to be Columbus or Cincinnati or Dayton or Akron or whoever else, the same way that Nashville is not trying to be Memphis, right? And Chicago is not trying to be anybody else. I think they're comfortable in the city's identity, but there's always a little work to do to get people from other places to recognize that that diamond, you know, and and that creates a little bit of a drive that that I'm attracted to. So it's <laughs> it's probably it makes a lot of sense why I've chosen those places or, or those. Absolutely. All wonderful places, wonderful food, each of them. So, India, people are going to flock to Cleveland for the APTA 2024 Rail Conference. Give us give us a 30 second. What do they have to look forward to? Not only when they come to the conference, but uh, uh, around uh, Cleveland when people come there in June for the APTA uh, Rail Conference. So I'm going to make a shameless plug to to ask that you guys play our our minute video. I think it's a minute and a half or so. I'll send it to you if you need it. At the end of this, that would be a great way to kind of show you better than I can tell you. We have a, a, a promo video that that we've released through APTA, and it really just embodies the spirit of the city. We're ready to to kind of reintroduce ourselves to to the industry. We really haven't been out there in the limelight since BRT came online about 15 years ago. So I think we've got a lot of new leadership in the city that is raring to go to make folks understand that Cleveland is really a, a city with a great heart. And it's, it's really a, a beautiful city. So we're super excited. I have also asked APTA to make sure they come back to us in about okay. another four years when we have our new rail cars. Right. And so we'll have a rags to riches story for you guys. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, I don't think it's a shameless plug by any stretch, but I'm I'm going to make one too. And just to inform everybody that the Impact Transit and Community Conference is actually hitting to Philadelphia in October of this year. You know a little bit about uh, Philadelphia, India, having went to school there. So we absolutely would love to have you come and join us in Philadelphia uh, if you can and share some of the wonderful uh, work that you're doing. It has been an absolute pleasure and honor talking with you, cousin. And we appreciate you. I am certainly sure I will see you very, very soon. Thank you so much for joining the podcast, India. Thank you. Thank you. It was a pleasure. Thanks for joining us. The Talking Headways podcast is a project of the Overhead Wire and appears first at Streets Blog USA. Thanks to our generous Patreon supporters for supporting this show and Mondays at the Overhead Wire. You can support the show by going to patreon.com slash the Overhead Wire. Sign up for our 18-year-old daily newsletter by visiting theoverheadwire.com or check the show notes for other cool merch and opportunities to connect. Follow along using your podcatcher of choice, but if you can't find it there, you can always find the show at its original home, usa.streetsblog.org. We'll see you next time at Talking Headways.